What is up, folks? My guest today is Chef John Merrick. He's a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America. He's worked in kitchens like Michael Mina, worked on the sales side in food distribution as well, for those of you that might have had a career change or just changed to a different role in the pandemic, or even just come to the kitchen from a different side of the industry. I always think those stories are fascinating and also just really underappreciated. I think there are skills that people put to work in roles like that that I just think are really cool. And most recently, he's been a content creator on TikTok, on YouTube, on Instagram, and also launching the new pop-up series called Family Meal Boise, where he hosts intimate tasting menu experiences on food. He's just excited to cook. I've been internet friends with John for ages, and when I was on a recent trip to Boise, Idaho for the ConvertKit Craft and Commerce Conference, it's a lot of C's, that's where John is based. He's based in Boise, and it just all worked out. The timing worked. The logistics worked. We finally got to meet in person. I ended up getting a upgrade on my hotel room so that I had like a proper separate room so that we could record an episode and I didn't have to like rent a studio space or anything like that. And aside from my voice being kind of a shot from the after party at the conference the night before, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. And so if you want to check out John online or any of these specific linkable things that we discussed, please do check out the show notes, which are always available right below this episode. As a heads up before we get into it, Yelp for Restaurants is offering listeners of the Repertoire Podcast a $100 Visa gift card to learn about how their Yelp guest manager can help your business finally have an all-in-one waitlist and reservations software solution to save your team time. In addition to that, if you choose to become a customer, you'll get $1,800 in ads credits for Yelp to use over your first six months of using the platform so you can get more eyeballs on your business. If you want to learn more, you can check out the link in the description or visit justinconnacom slash help. Now let's talk to John Merrick. I just appreciate you showing me around, like just being so hospitable because I like this is not you. You haven't been here for that long, but it feels like you have like the way that you've shown me around. So I want to say thank you for that. Uh, to start. My pleasure. So much more I could show you, man, like the mountains. I could go. We could we'll talk more about that, but. I know you were busy with, you know, last few days. Totally, totally. Can we start maybe with, to get a sense of you making the transition out of restaurants, did you feel any, like, sunk cost? Because you spent this time getting this experience, and then you move into what you're doing now in food distribution, but then you also, like, layer it on with TikTok stuff, so it's kind of like... I think a lot of people, me included, got this sense of, like, oh, well, you're not working as hard as you were in restaurants, when in reality it's like... You're kind of putting in more hours. So I had to come to terms with that. Did you feel any of that? Kind of like, uh, I'm not working as hard. I'm not as integrous of a chef anymore because I'm not in restaurants. Did you feel that? Sometimes, man. You know, I got out of kitchens technically. My last kitchen job was Toppers at the Wild Winnet. Actually, I didn't even work the kitchen there. I was working back in the house. That was my last restaurant. Okay. I was actually front of the house. Okay. So... You know, I kind of got a little burned out from the Michael Mina experience and then just doing this seasonal travel. So 2014, when I got out um, for a while, it felt weird. I think we talked about it the other day, like being in a restaurant on a Friday or a Saturday was like, how am I here and how am I not behind the line? Right. Um, You're talking about like eating at a restaurant. On a eating Friday. at a restaurant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it was also refreshing, you know. It was great to be able to cook dinner on a Friday and Saturday with the girlfriend and just enjoy family time and enjoy the time off. What, the biggest thing for me is what I miss is the brotherhood, the camaraderie, the inside jokes that are created in the kitchen. You know, all those like th that banter. You know, for me, working in a restaurant became my family, became my life. I was actually kind of anti-social, awkward in public. When I, you know, when I would meet people, they would be like, what the hell's wrong with this dude? It took me years to kind of get out of that because I, the restaurant was my life. I didn't know that. So how do you overcome that? Because now like people might see you on TikTok. They see you like making jokes. They see you making music. They see you like putting yourself out there truly. What was helpful to like get over that? People are surprised. And even till to, even today, people meet me and they're like, that dude's a little different than the dude on camera. And I think what it is, I think that I found that when I'm on camera, especially when it comes to food, I, it just pulls out this excitement in me. Like if we talk about sneakers, I'll be like, you know, okay. And then as soon as you mention food, my eyes change, my facial expressions, expressions change. And so I feel like 
the camera is a part of it, man. And you talk about the interest being in food. I can tell it when we, I mean, cause you and I went out to dinner on Thursday and then we went to lunch yesterday and I mean, we can jam on food for hours. I feel like, oh my God, I used to think that putting on a persona on camera was a bad thing. And then I started to realize that like, oh, the best, the best TV chefs, the best, like Jimmy Fallon being on TV, like you have to kind of be able to turn it on. And it's not fake. I think that's what I had to get out of my head is that it's not fake. It's just like, turn up the volume a little bit because you do have to entertain people. When I started on YouTube, it was always like, oh, well, I'm not going to be this kind of like loud and obnoxious YouTuber. But I found that people kind of feed off your energy almost. I don't know. Like, do, do, you, do you agree with that? Or do you feel like there's like people see more of the real you? Like, how do, how do you define that when you on camera? A hundred percent. I would say that what you see, especially on TikTok, when you see those organic moments of me saying some goofy thing, or I try not to swear, but if like, that is more my personality than what you see when you meet me out, perhaps at a social gathering. And what I mean by that is a lot of times, you know, growing up throughout my life, my close friends saw a version of me and people that didn't know me so well saw a different version of me. And it wasn't that I was consciously changing. It was more that as a human being, I only bring people in my circle that I'm comfortable with. I kind of, you know, that could go back to childhood and things, but I'm the kind of guy where I'm always not sizing people up, but I'm careful. I'm careful. And so that my personality that you see on cameras actually more me, like if, when we're good friends, that's more of what you see as opposed to maybe the reserved quiet John, you know. Ray DeLucci of Line Cook Thoughts has this great piece that he put out talking about how chefs shouldn't feel guilty leaving the kitchen. I think his story is he went from running a kitchen in Chicago to being an R&D chef. And when you think about making the transition out of kitchens, can you share for the audience a little bit of what your day-to-day -day looks like now? Just because a lot of people might have never even heard of the role that you're in, number one. And then number two, I want to talk about a little bit of the strengths that you can provide to that position because you have the chef background. Yeah. So my day-to-day -day now or when I first got out? I would say your day-to-day -day now. Let's start there. So my day-to-day -day now, it's a unique role. It's, it's kind of a chef role. It's not a corporate chef like I was for a few years until I moved to Boise and COVID and whatever. So my title is Artisanal Provisions and Produce Specialist. So what that means, Artisanal Provisions is a portfolio of artisanal items. And when I explain it to customers, they don't really know what I'm talking about. But really, if you think of charcuterie and you think of cheeses, anything that you would put on your menu or in a dish that falls under artisanal, you know, all the molecular, not molecular, but all the stuff you would use for pastry, gelatin sheets, like that's our portfolio, breads, desserts, purees, things like that. And a lot of it's imported for the most part, some of it's domestic, but I represent that portfolio. And then I also support our produce specialists with you know, if you own a restaurant, I'm consulting with you. I want to know where you, what's your, what are your needs? Like, you know, so do you need organic? Do you, you know, do you need microgreens? And, and so I manage both of those. And the punchline is I'm basically a consultant, if you will, as a support piece to the sales reps, working with customers at their property. We have a test kitchen. We'll bring them in. We'll do, I mean, we'll do full on presentations. So that's kind of my day to day, just, you know, trying to move the needle and, and consult, support them. You and I are both clearing our throats. I, I talked a little bit too loud at a after party last night and yeah, that's just how it goes. So do talk to me a little bit about the communication side of it, because you're, you talked about this idea of your eyes light up when you talk about food. And I think what's so cool is you've almost like built that into your life. Like that's what you get to do for a living is talk to chefs about food. Like that's such an unlock of being self-aware enough to say, listen, that's actually what I can do as a job that a lot of people might not understand. Was it, was that intentional or did, was that like, oh, this is kind of just a cool perk of this thing that I'm doing? You know, at first, I remember a few years ago, I was a little, I, I like to think that I'm a pretty humble guy. I wasn't when I was a young chef. I was that CIA grad that, you know, walked around with, you know, but as I got older, I got really humble. My, my boss at the time, my mentor, he's like, John, you're, you're too humble, bro. He's like, you, you rock. He's like, you're a talented chef. And so I feel like my communication with other chefs in, the, in a role 
that I'm in now, I've balanced, you know, you, you have to read the chef and you never want to offend them. And, and so when we communicate, I feel like it's, it's easy to find that common ground, common purpose and goal in communication, having the, the chef background. And then some of them are going to respect me and some of them are going to size me up because they don't, they don't know what I've, you know, done. But I've found that the chefs I do create relationships with, it's super strong and they respect the, as opposed to me never working, especially in kitchens, it would be a lot different in that case. Because a lot of these companies, it's easy to bring in a salesperson. There's a gajillion salespeople out there in the world. But if you don't understand food, if you don't know kitchen culture, if you don't know what it's like to scale out recipes, if you don't know what it's like to keep food costs in mind, if you don't know just the nature of the fact that ingredients are perishable, that can get you in a lot of trouble. And, you know, one thing for me, I, you know, just because I know when I was in the kitchens, I mean, I've yelled at sales reps. I've yelled at these people that they would bring in unannounced. Like I was a little bit of a, a Gordon Ramsay, if you will, at times. But one of the things I really try to maintain and focus on is I don't want to sell or place an item that doesn't fit the customer. If he's looking for a cheese, I want to sell him the cheese that is going to, that, that's going to benefit his menu, not because I want to push my agenda. And as a salesperson, as a consultant, that's huge for me. And I see a lot of people out there just trying to sell the shirt off their back. They'll sell you anything just to, you know, for whatever reason. So not a lot of people know this story. And you can stop me if this is, you know, too, too, a little bit too revealing to your current employer. But I, when I moved to Seattle, I knew that I wanted to make content, but I knew the content wasn't making money first yet. It wasn't large enough. I wasn't getting enough views. I didn't have enough sponsorships. I didn't have enough whatever. And so not a lot of people know that I worked on a food truck. And so I knew I wanted to still keep my hand in food because I still wanted to stay quote unquote sharp. But I didn't want the kind of like 14 hours a day managing a kitchen chef de cuisine position that I could have realistically applied for. And so I used this kind of secondary job to pay my bills. But then on my off time, I would make content. Is that the kind of like dichotomy that you're riding right now? Or is it something where it's like, this is actually a really happy medium. I like the fact that I don't have to monetize my content. Yeah. Where, where does your head go with that? So, you know, my, the good thing for me is, you know, this position, it's definitely not a nine to five. I mean, when, when my emails go off, I'm, I'm answering. There's a lot of times on weekends I have to, you know, I have to, you know, get some stuff done, but I balance it, man. It's a good balance. And I film at night, I edit at night and I edit on the weekends, film on the weekends. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely a good balance for sure. So you wouldn't, I guess what I'm asking is like, are you feeling this pressure to do want to go content full-time someday? I think about a friend of mine who has an art business, but then he has another job that is in a completely different industry. And he actually functionally juggles both of them. He has zero desire to go full-time with his art because the fulfillment he gets from his other job couldn't ever kind of, you know, kind of compete with that. And so if you had the opportunity to go full-time with content, would you, maybe that's the question. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a pretty easy answer. I mean, for sure. You know, when I first started dabbling in the TikTok came along, that's when I, I, like, I always wanted to film. I always say to people, I consider myself an introvert until you turn the camera on. It's just a weird thing about me. But when I invested in equipment and started taking it serious, I realized I could really build a brand. And it took a while. What I also noticed is like, I started developing a style. I started being more comfortable. And I would love to, yeah, absolutely. I want to build it. I want to take it as far as it can go, you know? And here's the thing. Even if I have a million subscribers tomorrow on YouTube, that doesn't mean I, I can't work for a distributor. There's a guy named Vic something. He works for a company in Salt Lake called Nicholas. Okay. I hope I'm okay to say that. He's been on Bar Rescue with uh, John Taffer. He's been on national television. And he's still, he's a corporate chef for the distributor. And I always tell my job, I'm like, look, what I'm doing is beneficial to what the movement is, you know? I mean, imagine a customer meets you and you have this brand versus being, not having that brand. It's nothing but positive. Do you have any advice for someone who might be in a position where they're like, they're seeing you, they're seeing Omnivorous Adam, you're seeing Chef Authorized blow up on TikTok and they're like, I kind of want to do that, but 
they're at a similar place to where I was, where you are, like the content's not paying for itself yet. Do you have any advice for, for that person as far as like there's skills to learn, there's camera presence to be aware of, there's editing stuff, there's like what kind of style you touched on style, like any advice for that person who might be listening? Yeah, for, for me, YouTube. I mean, I did not know how to color correct. I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know. I got my camera. I had to call my boy. He's a, he's a film guy. And he literally over the phone taught me how to set my camera. I haven't changed it since. And I like it, you know, so, and even beyond that, like even on your phone, the phones are great today. I feel like if you don't like being on camera, you don't have to be, you could just film and do a voiceover. If you don't like talking, you don't even have to talk. You do ASMR. You can, you know, have some fun with it. I would say if filming makes you like, it makes me happy. Like I love it. I get high off it. It's just like, you know, buying my first camera was like, like a, an emotional experience. So I, I love it. And I feel like if it's something you don't like, but you want to film, you have to find out what do you like about it? Is it, is it the cooking piece? Is it the filming? Is it the editing? Cause editing could suck. But to learn if you're, you know, if someone wants to get into this, man, we're so lucky. We have Google and YouTube and you know, I ask my friends all the time, like, you know, how do you get that color? He's like, dude, just YouTube. That's what I did. That's what I did too. Yeah. A lot of wedding film tutorials. That's what helped me a lot. And then what, what, DAW, I, no, it's not DAW, DAW's with music, but whatever the Da Vinci Resolve is called, mm -hmm. the editing platform, you have to find one you like. I did Da Vinci because it's free. I started on iMovie, which is also. Oh, free. same. It's terrible. It's so bad. It's so terrible. Oh my God. So bad. But if you just need cutting and maybe some titles thrown on screen, it's fine. And it's to your point, it's free. That's my first free. editing experience was actually a music video. So that's really what got me into a little bit of the film thing that started it all. And it was iMovie and it took me about three days for one video, but yeah. Mine was a uh, travel vlogging. So I was, I had a bunch of free vacation and it was easy to film travel vlogs and edit them. So yeah, that was, that was easy. We got to talk about these rap music videos, man. It's talking about music. We were talking at dinner the other night about how you can just spit off the cuff, just like give, give a topic and you can just go with it. Where does that come from? Why merge that with food? And then I have some follow-ups, but like, where yeah. does that come from? So my first ever passion, any something as a child that was ever interested was drawing. I was always into art. And uh, during high school, I started rapping just, and I was a big hip hop guy, huge. I'll make this, because this could be a whole podcast in itself. <laughs> I was in high school, there was a local radio station and every, I would listen to it at night. And at the end of the show, he'd have these local rappers come on and spit. That turned into me calling it over the phone. I'm 16 years old, 15 years old. And he's like, yeah, I'll put you on. I'll play the beat over the phone. And I started doing these shows, rapping on the cordless phone back then in the 90s, late 90s, spitting. And I was terrible. But then I started getting good. And he's like, dude, you're getting better. But then I started going to the radio station. And just imagine, it was like Wu-Tang. There'd be like nine of us in the, in the thing, right in pulling records out of, the, out of the thing to give them like, yo, we want to spit on this beat. At the end of the show, it would be like, oh, dude, it would be like Wu-Tang. We'd be like, who's up next? Oh, boom, it's spitting. And that just kept going, man. I started my first studio session, recording. I was like, people knew me in high school. I put a mixtape out and music was very, very prominent. But at that same duration of time, I got into food. So during high school, I was cooking, I was rapping, and I did, I've always done both. And I was, you know, I was really good at, I could, I could rap. I could, I could do music. I probably could have made a career out of it. But that's where that comes from. Why I put it with the food, people always ask me to like, people know I could rap, like friends. So they'd be like, John, you're an amazing chef. You spit. You need to do like a cooking chef thing. And I was like, no, nah, that's corny, man. It's so cheesy. I'm not doing that. It's gimmicky. And then someone asked me, actually, it was my buddy, Rich. I got to give Rich Conway a shout out from back home. And he asked me to do it during the TikTok rise of my little, you know, but it was random. I was listening to a beat and I started having these mac and cheese flows come. And I was like, if you own a for you page and start scrolling. If the, and I'm like, wait, this is kind of, it's not cheesy. This is good lyrics. And it's, and then I did that and then boom, dropped that. And people went crazy, dude. The love and support on that video, people actually truly enjoyed it. And then I left it alone and authorizes like, dude, him and Woodfire are like, bro, you need to keep doing those. You're going to be the biggest thing on TikTok. <laughs> and I was like. I don't know, maybe some personal things happened. I think it was maybe some personal things that got me away from it. But 
And then the rapping chef came up and he, and then like, you know, he blew the fuck up. And then authorized is like, bro, I told you. And then people are saying, well, who, there's only one rapping chef. I'm like, I don't care who did it first, but I'm like, I kind of was on TikTok first, but he, shout out to the rapping chef. He's killing it. We talk. He's a great dude. We actually plan on collaborating. We mentioned it at least. So we'll see what happens. Dude, it's so encouraging to see it come to life and the creativity, just like how you take your in-depth knowledge of different ingredients and techniques and then rhyme them together. And I think we were talking the other night about the fact that like you even over index on it where you don't just make the song, but then you cook along with it. And that I think is crazy. Like was, was that always the idea or do you, is that just your kind of like high standards brain being like, well, if I'm going to make the song, I got to be able to also prove that I can cook the dish. Yeah. I'll, I'll go back to music. So I treated it naturally like a music video. That's really what it is. So I'm writing the song and while I'm writing the recipe. And then when I shoot the video, the song's recorded. So I voice over just like you would shoot a rap or a music video. And I just do that just that's because my natural, my natural go-to, but it's so much work. I realized, and I'm looking at the rapping chef. I'm like, damn, he's just, he's just he's pulling out his phone. I'm like, what am I doing? But I, I just, my brain goes there quality, you know, it's just like, I want that quality. And it's actually easier to do the song first and just, you know, and then sometimes I'll like some of the song, like the sushi, holy shit, man. Like you have to record every part. Like I'm actually going through the recipe and it's like, damn dude. Yeah, and the Escoffier one was real tough. I love that I made, one. I made all five songs. Yeah. <laughs> too yeah. Good. I love that one. Those will be linked up in the show notes for everybody that wants to check them out because they're, they're phenomenal. When you, and, and there, there's, there's zero pressure to give kind of like a answer that's going to be true in five years. Cause I kind of almost want to like give people a snapshot of where you're at right now in your kind of like TikTok social media, kind of like video production space, because I was in this era, I want to say like three years. How long have you been creating social media content now? Since the, since COVID. Okay. So you're coming Maybe up on COVID two, point. almost two years. Yeah. So when I was like two years in, I called it a portfolio of opportunities. So this is very like investor strategy where you put bets on a bunch of different things and you just wait to see which one's going to go. And then you kind of like double down on that one. Do you think about it in that way when you're thinking about like cooking content, recipe content, day in the life content, wrapping content? We were talking the other night about like the combination of like wrapping over other people's content, like. And, and again, it's not, it's not a bad thing. I just want to hear about how you're thinking about content strategy. Five years. Yeah. Yeah. I have a mentor who actually used to own a rest, the first restaurant I worked for wildly successful. He got into podcasting. He, I think he actually don't quote me on this, but he's one of the first sports podcasts in the country. He's like, this guy's bona fide. He does NS, I think it's, but anyway. He's my mentor. He's one of the smartest guys I know. And he's been giving me like this template. He's like, John, here's what you need to do. Love your stuff. Your thumbnails need to be better. You know, you need to start doing YouTube. And it's all these you need to do's. And admittedly, like I could do, be doing better, I think in five years, following my mentor's advice along with patience is the two things. So I'm patient. My YouTube, I don't, I know I could be posting more. I want it to grow. It will, but I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm patient. Because if I let my brain go into this like panic mode, it's going to affect my workflow. So I'm just like, I just go, man. I do best under pressure. If you tell me to put an amazing TikTok rap video up, I'm like, okay. But if you tell me there's some competitive piece to it, it's, it's done and posted the next day. So what is that? Is that you setting deadlines? Is that you telling the audience like, hey, I'm going to upload tomorrow. And then you, you kind of like self-impose that pressure. I think like, you know, I have to kind of do a daily reprieve where I, I keep my mentality on those goals. And I remember, I start to put things into perspective. Like, you know, I'm not getting younger. The world's not going to stop evolving. So it's self-motivation really. You've mentioned the word mentor a couple times now. Was that always how you saw people that were a couple rungs on the ladder above you? Is like, oh, these people can mentor me. This is actually smart for me to listen to these folks because I think not a lot of people, one, look for mentors, period. And number two, not a lot of people know how to be good mentees. So it's like they have someone in their life who is, for all intents and purposes, a mentor, 
but for whatever reason, they don't listen to them. Like, yeah. can you talk a little bit about mentorship and why, why it's important? Yeah. And I never, it's funny because it's funny you asked that because I was thinking about this the other day. I had all these mentors, but I, I never called them that. I didn't know they were, and I didn't know how to use them as mentors. And I didn't know how to be a mentee. It wasn't until like, I'll be honest with you, man, about five years ago, Guy Zaner with the guy I worked for, again, one of the smartest, brilliant chefs I know, where I, the words started to be in my vocabulary, in my vernacular. And now as I've, as years passed, I, I cherish it so much. I think it's so important. And I continue to this day to try to have mentors in my life. You know, I, you know, like there's a few guys that I continue to talk to, but huge for me because I'm so open. I'm the kind of guy, like I always want to learn. I'm the chef that's like, especially now I've gotten so humble where it's like my first mentor, that's what he told me before culinary school. He goes, if there's one thing, if you forget everything I taught, you remember to always be a sponge. He goes, when your sponge fills up and you have to wring out that information and store it somewhere, always be a dry sponge and be ready for information. So, but it, it's so helpful, man. Another word you've mentioned is humility a couple times. And I fell into this place where you almost have to not be humble to publish something, to like put something out there. Cause it's kind of narcissistic. Like I'm going to put my face on camera and I'm going to call the account my name and I'm going to like put this thing out and I'm going to have the title that says my face. I'm going to hashtag my name. How do you balance like humility with like bravado and charisma and personal branding, like in, in that, in that sense? Cause there's a lot of people listening who are probably like you and I were there. When you're working in professional kitchens, you're incentivized to like fade in with the wallpaper, you know, like don't stand out. How do you, how do you balance that? I don't even think I think about it. I think I'm so relentlessly gunning to be successful. I think it's a fight inside of me that is just, I want to do it for myself. I want to do it for my family. I, I don't even, like, it's funny you said, I, I never thought about it like that. Like you post your face, you, you hashtag your name, you're, you know, you're humble, but you're not. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know that I think about it. I don't even know that I care to think about it. I feel like I just go, man. Yeah. And I guess the only way someone would be able to validate my humility would be to know me, but you're right. You're doing both. Yeah. It's weird. And you know, you kind of have to get over it from the sense that the people that we've mentioned today on the show, like the good ones, you know, the ones who are genuinely like trying to put out value, trying to help people, trying to grow in, in the right way. Uh, yeah. Anyways, you know, I, I gotta say it's, it's really interesting and surreal that we're here. Cause it's like, I've been following your movement for a minute. I mean, I, in fact, I started following your movement on Instagram right around the time I started following a cook named Matt. You two, for some reason, are remind me of each other. And well, we got, look the same. Well, that, <laughs> that's yeah, part of it. <laughs> that's part of it, right? In ways, certain styles. And I mean, I was following a cook named Matt back in the day with you, you know, so mm. it's really dope to be here. Topic wise, I'm sure something will come to me, but. You know, one of the things about, I notice about you, like what you do, and I'm going to get away from myself now, is like the, your content brings me back to the mentality I had in culinary school, that young guy. Like you, like if I'm having a, an inspired day and I watch you, I'm like, it brings me back to that. I want to go sharpen my knife. I want to go mise en place. I want to, you know, just thinking about food and the conversations. Like we talked about that dinner and we critiqued it and we broke it down. You know how refreshing that was? And helpful even to me, because like we both give perspectives that maybe we didn't identify. So I, I, th I just thought that was super dope. Yeah. Thank you, man. I mean, honestly, like to not only just be internet friends for so long, but now just kind of like be able to be in your city. And I think you messaged me, you're like, no way you're coming to Boise. I couldn't believe it. I was <laughs> like, what? Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad we could record this. Number one. Number two, like, I think a lot of chefs, they get lost in the sauce is maybe the best way to say it. Where there's this fire that ignites in you when you're early to the humble point when you, when you are humble and there are things you don't know. And for whatever reason, too many HR meetings, too many conversations about food cost, too many yelling, screaming matches with purveyors, too many people walking out. They get to this place, like not showing up for work. They get to this place where they like lose the fire in them to be excited about showing up with sharp knives or reading a cookbook on their day off or that's, that's never gone away from me. And what I would always think to myself when I was like on the line or 
doing the orders for the next day when I was a sous chef or at stages in my life when I couldn't connect with other chefs. It was like, how cool would it be if this is what I could do? Similar to your point of like, how cool would it be if I could just like rap about food and have people see it, you know? So I was like, just do more of it. And we live in an era where you can actually just kind of like that this whole conference that I've been in Boise to is just kind of like re and reignited this idea of like, you can get paid to do what you love. That's the biggest piece, dude. Like I, I look around my studio, I paint, I'm just an artsy dude. I, you know, I obviously do, I rap, I do cooking, but I'm like, I, sometimes I look around and I'm like, imagine getting paid to, to just do my art. Like, that's awesome. And not to say, like you said earlier, like not to say that I wouldn't, this isn't like a, a flag, a red flag to my employer or whatever. It's just, you know, it's just real. One of the things I'll mention, but the, you know, and this, the segue to this conversation could be a podcast in itself, which is how I got into cooking and all that. But one thing I try to remember is that for me, cooking literally saved my life. Go on that. I, you know, again, to keep this story short, I, f I fell into it by accident. I was getting kicked out of school. I was actually getting expelled. I was at a Votech program. My mother begged them. And I, at this point, have been through five shops, masonry, auto mechanics. I had one choice. I randomly chose, I think I chose culinary because one of my buddies was there. I wanted to hang out with him. And I went into the, the program. I started cooking at ninth grade. So it was Votech started in ninth grade. And the rest was history. And by 11th and 12th grade, full time, full time. I got out of high school and I worked the line six days a week. But I say it saved my life because they, I might as well tell this story. This might get emotional, we'll see. But when they, when they gave me an option and they basically they told my mother, we're going to ask the culinary instructor, his name is Dave Joyce. They went to him, I later found out, and they said, Dave, this kid's getting kicked out and uh, he's a menace. And I wasn't that, listen, I wasn't that bad, but you know, I don't know what I did, but I did something, man. But they, they approached him and they said, Dave, you don't have to accept this kid. He's, he's, he's a, he's a nightmare. He goes, you don't have to accept him. And he, he, you know, he, he took me on, man. He'd never met me. He just heard that story. And like, dude, if he didn't say yes to that, to accepting me as a student, I, I, I may have been dead or in jail. That's real, real talk. That's wild. And, uh, you know, I get a little emotional cause it's like, it really saved my life, man. Cooking matured me. It brought me from this young street kid running around to Chef White's co competitions, accepted into the CIA. Like, I was a success story in Votech, man. Like, it really inspired a lot of, like, teachers to look at some of these students and give them a better chance or give them a second chance and gave them hope. And, and the rest was history, man. It really matured me. I think a lot of folks might... Like, thank you for sharing that, number one. I think a lot of folks might leave that as such a great macro picture. But when you get to that first day or first week in the kitchen, like, what's going in your mind? Are you, like, rejecting the structure and the culture? Or did you just, like, eat it up as, like, this is a challenge? Like, can you, can you remember what that, what that felt like? Yeah, I, you know, for me, I never respected men in authority. Oh. My father was never around. Yeah. So I never respected men. And if someone told me something, like what, I was raised by my grandmother and my mother. So if a, if a male figure told me what to do, it was fuck you, who, you know? But what changed was I, I noticed I started respecting, I started listening to people that I respected. And since I respected Dave, I would do anything he said. If he yelled at me, I kept my mouth shut. So there's something about that chef figure that fathered me. It, it really did. It allowed me to, to grow up and, and listen to another man to tell me what to do, let alone tell me what to do, but to be screaming at me. I always said, I'll let a chef scream at me if I respect him, but you know, take me out of the kitchen and let a man scream at me. It's a little bit different. So I naturally just humbly accepted that, you know, respect for, for chefs, man. That's so interesting. You say, I, I don't, I don't think we've talked about this. I had a, so I was, my, my parents got divorced when I was three and I love my dad, he, but he, his custody for, with my sister and I was only seeing us every other weekend. So I was also raised by my mom. And my dad is not the kind of like handyman, get his hands dirty, teach you how to build a tree fort type of guy. He has a lot of other kind of like more academic values that he instilled in me. But as you were saying that, I think I have a very similar resonance to why I attached myself to chefs. 
because there was this kind of like masculine figured out people talk about the brigade structure as like it's like the army yeah. there was like something there that like i was also craving yeah it definitely gave me structure and balance when you i mean any anything else from that just kind of like those early days in kitchens after you've tried so many things and you finally get into this environment that feels right anything else from from that time that stands out it was weird it's just so interesting it's like was it fate? Like, what was it? Like, how did I land? It just made sense. It was like a perfect fit. Like, I remember the exhilaration was just one of the things I loved. Like, especially even in Votech, when you're cooking all day and you're sweating and that feeling of a parched mouth and that first sip of a soda and then the, just that exhilarating feeling of like, you just worked out. Like, I remember that being awesome or that first cigarette after like a four hour run in the kitchen. It just, you know? There was something about that that I fell in love with, man. And it just, I think the exhilaration, it was, it was an endorphin rush. Do you, how do you mature from there? Like to continue to get a little bit more of a sense of your background, how did you mature from that point? Cause I think a lot of people, and you probably know some of these people, they'll spend 15 years in that phase, just like running their body into the ground, just like chasing high after high after adrenaline after adrenaline. Did you have a point when that became a little bit too much? How did you progress from there? <laughs> I, well, so I was running this restaurant for three years in Pennsylvania and we parted ways. So to go back, when I was in culinary school, man, I wanted to do fine dining. That's all I wanted to do. And I wanted Michelin star level. And for whatever reason, I didn't take that path when I was younger. So when I left Pennsylvania, I ended up working. I'm like, I'm going to a Michelin star restaurant. So I staged at Aquarello in San Francisco. I kind of wish I took that job. She ended up getting two stars. Kitchen was small. Food was amazing. And I'm like, I went to Mina and I saw Mina's kitchen as like, this is that aha moment. And then I'm 29 years old. I don't want to be a line cook. I didn't want to spend two years trying to be a sous chef. So I took a bunch of notes and I bounced and, but to, to your point, grinding, that's how I did it. My whole career. I just went into the wheels full, flew, I fell off. I just went too hard. And I think I really got out of that mentality when I left the kitchen. Cause that's all I knew. I don't know if I ever, you know, like when I was a head chef, man, I was working harder, not smarter, admittedly. And I, so I think when I got out of the kitchen and had this work-life balance, that's when I realized like. I'll never let myself do that again. If I went back in kitchens, I would have much more wisdom and I would, I like to think I would approach it different, but no, that's how I did it, man. When you go into this high caliber environment that was Michael Mina's kitchen, how was that different? What did you learn? Some takeaways? Cause I think a lot of folks listening are thinking about they're, they're in a casual environment right now. Maybe they're in culinary school and they're thinking of, you know, kind of like high caliber places. Any stories from your time there or specific takeaways that you got from working in that kind of an environment? Yeah, I actually worked with him. So I didn't know he was going to be there, but his chef had to, had to leave, take a leave. And I was in the alleyway, I think maybe having a cigarette and Mina comes up to me and he saw my CIA shirt and I think he's a grad and he's like CIA and instantly that, that pound happens. He was actually working the pass. So when, when he came in, everyone, all the sous chefs were like, Mina's here. So the pass has to be perfect, tape down the linen, boom. What I learned from working at Mina was, I remember looking at the cooks next to me that didn't go to culinary school. And they were, they would run circles around these guys I worked with back East in these like smaller towns. I'm like, this cook's been cooking for two years. These women I worked with, this Asian girl, this white girl with tattoos on her face. <laughs> these girls were so bad ass, man. The white girl with the tattoos on her face. I remember she lived in Oakland. And I went, I was like, chef, she has to take the train home late. He's like, dude, do you see her? She's like, they're more afraid of her. <laughs> but like, these were badass, awesome cooks. And I just remember being like, now I could see why culinary school is not needed. It, it, depending. It, it, but that was one of the aha moments. The technique, obviously uh, the technique, it, it was standards, man. Like, you know, it brought you into a restaurant where you don't have a choice but to learn the right way. And uh, you could pick up so many bad habits. And I feel like Michelin stars aren't the only good restaurants, but I feel like it's a good starting point to quality and a good restaurant, good practices. We had a rebranding of this 
podcast. It used to be called the Emulsion Podcast. Now it's called the Repertoire Podcast. And I have this question in my brain that I've been kind of like kicking around and I'm going to try it on you and we're going to see where it goes. And I, I hope to have it be a, I ask every guest this question. Question is, what's your favorite part of your repertoire? Define repertoire. So I look at it as a collection of skills that you've either internalized or mastered that at a moment's notice, you can pull it out and use it to execute, to basically, you know, so from your experience, the audience now knows you've been to culinary school, you've been in high caliber kitchens, you've been on the sales side, the distribution side. When you think about all the skills that you've kind of amassed, what's the most valuable part of your repertoire? I think one of the things that the first thing that comes to mind is for so long I was cooking other chefs food and I never had that opportunity to cook my menu. And even to this day, I never ran a restaurant where it was fully my menu. And I think that one of the strengths I've developed over the years, especially doing the content now, is that I'm able to create dishes and do R and D and put together this homemade pita and dive into different cuisines and then master them at, even though at home, I have the chef background, even though we're doing it at home, master a technique, not master a cuisine, but master a dish of a cuisine. And I think that gives you so much more of an upper hand than even some Michelin star cook that's cooking Michael Mina's food. That's all he knows. But now I think one of my strengths is I've had a chance to dabble in so many different techniques and it just adds to my suitcase. And that's just the first one that comes to mind. Keep going. Yeah, do another one. You know, I think one of the things being, I think, I'd like to think having growing humility throughout the process allowed me to retain more technique. Like I meet so many chefs that are just like, they know what they know and they just stop learning because like it's an ego thing. Chefs never want to admit they're, they don't know something, God forbid, you know, but I think that helped too, man, just being open to learning. Even though I know the answer, I might. I might know how to make an amazing pita bread. And then you come over and you're like, well, you know, we, I kind of did it this way over here. I could be like, well, no, my shit's perfect. But if I'm, if I shut my mouth and just look at what you're doing, I might, I might learn something. Wow. That was actually something better than I did, you know? So I, I, I kind of, kind of try to keep that approach. Let's do some rapid fire ones. What's something that you've changed your mind on in recent memory? Something I changed my mind on in recent memory. Or something you thought was true, but then after seeing a counterexample, you're like, maybe that's not true. I always thought my content, I'll talk about content. I always thought creating videos has to be the best. I, you know, I got the $4,000 camera and I got the expensive lens and DaVinci Resolve and the iMac. Actually, when I did the dragon fruit video, I, the only reason I did it is because it was dragon fruit there and I was doing another video and I'm like, well, maybe I'll just have a filler video. I'll just chop it up. So what I changed my mind on is the videos that I try the least are some of the most successful. And I guess I changed my mind on the fact that you don't need perfect crispy content to have a successful video. And now my mentality is more like organic. Even on camera, I'm less scripted. I'm, that's why I started doing that goofy stuff and just having fun. Whereas if you watch my earlier videos, it's like, you know, perfect measurements, eight, eight, 50 grams of this. And it's like, nah, dude. I loved that you talked about fun when we were out to dinner the other day, because to my point of people get lost in the sauce, they think they have to say that they know everything, that they can't say that they don't know something, that they have to be super serious, that they have to be exacting. And yeah, if you're not having fun, it's kind of like, what's the point? Yeah, 100%. It's your first day of your weekend. Let's say that would have been yesterday or maybe it's today. And you kind of lumber into your kitchen and you're going to make eggs for yourself. How do you make those eggs? Let's see here. I'm an over easy guy. I've always been. But you know, if I, it depend, if I have time, I like a technique I saw recently where you take a double boiler and you do the soft scramble, the Gordon Ramsay. I call them Gordon Ramsay eggs. And I love that. I bake sourdough. I started doing sourdough starter. I brought my starter from New York. So for me, the perfect egg is that sourdough in a pan, olive oil, crispy, and a freaking ton of like soft Gordon Ramsay eggs, we'll call them on top. That's, that's my, that's tight. As you're progressing through kitchens, as you're learning about sales, as you're starting to think about content, is there a book that's been particularly impactful for you in your journey? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So every book, I used to have a huge book collection from, from school, all my CI books, everything. And my car caught on fire in 2010, I think. Holy shit. And everything burned. I almost burned the Turkey Hill down, which is oh a great my God. Mina story. Oh, and I'll tell another quick story. Yeah. When I left my, I'll never forget this. I left Michael Mina and I had built my book collection up and I stopped in Chicago to my homie, my best friend, my brother, Barry Joyner. He's a chef out in Boston. And this is when I burned out and I gave him all my books. I, I said, I'm never cooking again. I'm fucking done. I was just burned out, man. And I gave him all my books. So anyway, I'm slowly gathering my book collection back. One book that's really been interesting to me because I've been diving, diving into Lebanese Syrian cuisine. My father being Syrian, I have my mother's last name, whatever. I have this Syrian cookbook from, I forget her name, but I look at these recipes and they're so simple. And I, and I so I did this dish, chicken hushway, hushway is stuffing. So you usually take meat and it's a rice stuffing, not like Thanksgiving, they use rice. So anyway, I'm looking at these recipes and I just have fun with them. I follow directions, but I tweak it. And it's some of the most tasty food, man. It's so freaking awesome. And that's my new thing now. I'm really focused on Lebanese cooking, Indian. I mean, the spices in Indian food is just so amazing to me. We were talking the other day about this idea of simple versus complex. And I think that there's something there where you can have something that's so simple because you're probably working with great ingredients. Or you can have something that's a 13 ingredient spice blend and there's so, so much complexity, but you don't, you don't even see the complexity because it's like all of it's been reduced to a powder and it's coating a piece of paneer maybe. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating. Fascinating. I love the statement or whoever said it, or it's sometimes the ingredient that you eliminate or take away that makes the dish. And I think that lately, man, I've just been my cooking's definitely gotten more simple and homey and, and rustic. I heard that definition of great editing at the conference this weekend. Great editing is when there's nothing left to take away. So in other words, your art is not done when there's nothing left to add. Your art is done when there's nothing left to take away. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting. We turn the mics off and you get a call that you just want an all expenses paid trip to eat at your dream restaurant. And when you get there, there's someone you've always wanted to have dinner with waiting to not just speak with you, but spend the evening with you. What is that restaurant and who is that person? Dead or alive. Let's do dead or, let's do, could be dead or alive. I might, I might give you a couple. Yeah. If that's all right. Please. So I gotta be careful. I'm gonna get emotional. First will be my grandmother. You know, she, she's never been on a plane. Okay. She passed away in 2020. And I would, it would be my grandmother sitting there in Ireland at a, I don't even care where it's at, at some restaurant. I would probably take her to one that's a little more humble because she doesn't, she's not into fancy food. And that would be a dream. Bourdain, 100%. Where would I, where would I take Bourdain? I would want to eat, oh, I would want to eat with Anthony Bourdain at one of my restaurants back home. I would take him to Newtown Cafe, which is a small rinky-dink pizzeria where they, if you go in the kitchen, you see residential stoves and old ladies in aprons pulling trays of pizza out of the freaking oven. And growing up, dude, Newtown was like a family heirloom, dude. We freaking loved it. I would love to bring Bourdain there, drink a beer, and eat, eat a pizza. What would you ask Bourdain? I don't What would I ask Bourdain? Or what would you hope to talk about, I guess? Like, it's not even a, maybe a question, but like, you get the chance to actually share a meal with him. Maybe it's not like, maybe there's not cameras around. There's not like a bunch of other people. It's just you and him. What would you talk about? I would talk to Bourdain about um, addiction, his experience with the substance, and I would talk to him about what his struggles are. Now I know he's more about his struggles than I did before he passed away, but I would talk about that because I personally went through that myself. I mean, we all know it's like chefs get a pass if they're involved in drugs and alcohol and they have that as history. It's like, it's almost like you get away with it because you were a chef. But admittedly, man, like I, I you know, and around 2010, I actually quit drinking for four years in 2010. And so I, I could relate to him in that regard. And I would really want to know what, I, I would talk to him about mental health. I would really want to know what his struggles are and how he deals with that. And I think that alone could be, you know, even before we start talking food. Yeah, that's huge. And he's, he is, he is one of the most popular answers to that question. But I'm all also, because he was so prolific and touched so many things, writing, food, culture, travel, I'm always curious how people would approach time with him differently. 
Well, and it's, I'll tell you a quick story. I'll tell you a quick story. I was in Nantucket Island. I hadn't drank in four years. And I'm in this new place and new friends and new environment. It's summer. And I'm like, you know, can I have a drink? Can I not? And I thought about Bourdain. And I remember saying, well, Bourdain did heroin. Bourdain had struggled with alcohol. But he's on TV traveling the world. And he's able to have a drink once in a while. And I use that as an example. But then you flash forward, and, and obviously the tragedy would happen. It's like, was I using the wrong example to justify? So, and that goes back to why I would love to just talk about his struggles, because I struggle with a lot, of, a lot of that too, man. And mental health to me is, is, is really, really big. How do you stay on top of that? Like, there's a lot of chefs who probably, they're where we, you and I were 10 years ago, where it was like, mental health doesn't matter. Just suck it up and figure it out. Grit through it. It's going to be fine. Who cares? Mental health was never at the forefront. And now it's finally being talked about. So how do you stay on top of your mental health? So when I, when I wasn't drinking, I was involved with a lot of people in recovery. And there was a lot of fundamentals that I got menteed with. And uh, that, that'll stay with me forever. Some of those things like a daily reprieve waking, trying to free myself of anger, resentment, resentment's a big one, you know, anger, you know, when I cause damage and wreckage, you know, how do I, so daily reprieve, meaning like I open my day with this, like almost prayer of like, you know, balancing myself. When someone cuts me off, am I doing road rage or am I just making a joke out of it? Like, <laughs> go ahead, you know, and then doing it at night. That's a big one for me. So you do it twice a day? I try. Well, I used to. Yeah. And no, I'm gen genuinely like, this is a very tactic, excited audience. It's not necessarily talk about it in the macro because I think a lot, too many people talk about it. Mental health is important. Mental health is important. It's like, yeah, we all know that it is, but it's like, what's helped you get into the strategies that you've used? And, and that's why, again, like part in my just like over questioning sometimes, but I think getting to the heart of like, what do you actually do? Because that helps, that helps the listener. Yeah. Creating art definitely helps me. Obviously cooking, that's a big piece to it, you know, and then, you know, Again, having these mentors, like there's people I talk to that, that we, we basically, like therapy too. I saw a therapist in 2020 when COVID first hit. The company I was with went bankrupt. My, my girlfriend, who I thought I was going to marry, moved to Hawaii. Lost my job. My grandmother's dying. Like I was going through a tough time, man. And then I had this thing, this health issue, and I was in a dark place. And I met this therapist, dude, and she, there's a lot of bad ones, but she was awesome. And I think for me personally, diving into my childhood and the traumas and the things that not, no, no one's heard me talk about, those are the things I have to continue to work on. Single mother, single grandmother, no father. Like it's, I call it suppressed because a lot of it's suppressed. I don't know what's there until you bring it up. And you might, someone might say something that sparks a childhood memory and I can get emotional because it's like, it's all hidden, man. It's all, I've been, my whole life, I've just been fighting through it. So I, till this day, I need to continue to to work and in therapy shouldn't be this taboo thing, man. I don't know why it is, but I was talking to a guy the other day, he had the suicide prevention for the high school kids. And I had a conversation with them and I asked him, I said, well, this money's cool. You, you fund all these things. I said, are you guys doing anything to offer therapy? I want to see therapy more available. If you break your arm and you go in the hospital, they cast you up and they, they work with you. But if God forbid you want to see a therapist and they, they, it's like, oh, your next you're next up for the loony bin. Like, I don't know, man. It's tough to find one. I'm still trying to find a therapist that's solid. Did you, when you were doing sessions, were they remote or in person? I was in Ithaca, so totally remote. Everyone was petrified. Everyone had five masks on, goggles. Like, it was crazy. So we didn't meet in person, but I, I got a lot out of, out of it virtually. I'll share the same. So my, my wife and I, we go to a, we had a premarital therapist and now it's a, just a relationship therapist for us. And we Love using it as a resource to have a third party who's not one of our friends to like just talk through it. Like we've learned so much more about each other through this. And at first it was in person, but then we transitioned to remote. And I think maybe a lot of people think of therapy as this like you're gonna go you're gonna go lay on a couch like this and talk to somebody. I'm, basically what I'm doing is I'm I'm upvoting your suggestion for therapy and your advocacy for it. Yeah, and it's good to have someone that's not emotionally connected with you. That's huge. the biggest piece. Huge, huge, huge. I got to get on the road soon. Is there anything else that you wanted to chat through or any topics that we kind of like gently touched on that you want to dive deeper into? I don't, I don't think so, man. My brain's all over the place now. We had this conversation. So 
I'll think of something after we turn the mic off. I'm of sure. course, of course. And we'll do an episode two for sure. And just excited for you to come to Seattle. You'll hang out with me. You'll hang out with Matt, I'm sure. And we'll just, you know. We'll yeah, that'd be dope. Cool. That's the last thing I'll say is I'm excited to get out there. And, you know, I think that as we grow through the summer and, and, and the world keeps moving, dude, we're definitely, we're definitely going to see each other soon. And we'll do some, we'll do some cool stuff out there. I'll bring the camera and. We'll appreciate it. I want to see your, I want to see your stuff. Too. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. I want the tour. I mean, listen, it's not, it's not that fancy. I was taking photos of your setup yesterday and I mean, you see the setup that I'm rocking now, this fits in a suitcase and this is literally like all that I need. And I think that's also the beauty of it. And maybe, you know, a thing I can leave folks with is this idea of, and you probably know this too, for $5,000, which sounds like a lot to someone starting out, you can get to what to someone like Anthony Bourdain or Michael Mina would have walked into in a production kitchen 10 years ago for $50,000. Oh, yeah. So this idea that it's become so democratized and any of us can start, I think that that's what the beauty of it is. And I'm just stoked to see you like out there creating. Dude, awesome. Thanks, Thanks man. You, man. Same. Man, that was emotional. That was a roller coaster ride. I really enjoyed it. Get, just getting to connect with John and, and record a long form conversation between the two of us. And just a massive thanks to John for showing me around Boise, just being so hospitable. And I just get to geek out with getting the snapshot of someone's career and just where they're at in their process. And I just can't wait to bring you folks a part two of a conversation with John soon. Quick reminder that Yelp for Restaurants has upgraded their offer for listeners of the Repertoire podcast, not just to give you the $100 Visa gift card for trying out the platform, but then $1,800 hundred dollars in ads credits for Yelp that you can take advantage of when you use the offer code that's available in the description of this podcast. You can always check out justincona.com Yelp. Until next time, roll the outro. Well, well, here we are together again at the end of another episode of the Repertoire Podcast. If this is your first time listening, this is a show for hospitality creators who want to think better, increase their performance, and believe that it's possible to take lessons from what others have already learned. I am your host, Justin Kana, and if you're new here, I'd like to personally welcome you to the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Friendly heads up to check out the show notes inside of the description of this podcast if you want to check out previous guests, links to specifics that got brought up in this episode, as well as other helpful content that we create and share here online because everything we do is focused on helping you along your journey. If you don't have a ton of time, the best place to start is with some value sent straight to your inbox every single week. It's called the Repertoire Newsletter, where we share knowledge on sharpening your skills, asymmetric upside, and exploring the industry beyond the status quo. If you subscribe, we'll keep you up to date on trends that are shaping the hospitality creator ecosystem. We'll share discounts on gear that we find, as well as content that we've been producing ourselves and helpful articles that we've already read and decided are worth your time. Last up, if you want to connect with other other industry professionals in the Repertoire Pro community, you want to check out courses like Total Station Domination or download free tools that we've created, you can learn more at joinrepertoire.com. That's J-O-I-N-R-E-P-E-R-T-O-I-R-E.com. The only ask from me is that if you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate a review of this show on Apple Podcasts as well as Spotify to help the podcast universe know that people like us like shows like this. Regardless, I'll see you in the next episode. My name is Justin Kana, and I hope Hope you have a good one.